Is it deja vu? Or are you uh, hallucinating? Anybody here who does not have a set of study questions for the final exam? Okay. <laughs> you lost yours. You can have another one. I think I have plenty of them. You need one? Okay. <laughs> You're welcome, sir. Thank you are? Um, here's the way, uh, 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 what, what we're going to do from here. Well, first of all, you got my email today, right? Yeah. Everybody got? What? No. Yeah. But I haven't my email in like week. Well, <laughs> that would explain why you didn't get my email. Yeah. <laughs> yes, right. My TA's wife had a baby Saturday night. Um, and I, I haven't been able to get in touch with him, so I will be in touch with you as soon as I can find out when he's going to have those papers done. I mean, he, it was, this was a tense weekend, so it was, you know, communication was probably, pardon, sorry? When's the last day of classes Thursday, do you think we'll have the papers done? That's what I was just trying to address. I have not been able to talk to him. I certainly hope so. Uh, well, I won't <laughs> keep that to myself. Uh, but if not, then you know, we've got to have to do something pretty special. I mean, we, you know, we I need to get you the papers. Also, have a time for anybody who wants to talk to him about the paper after you get the paper, not the day you get the paper when you had a chance to look at it. So, as I said, I will be in touch with you about when we can get them back. I hope it's Thursday. If not, we'll see. Okay, I'm sorry about this, but there it is. Okay, so um, the first thing we're going to talk about three things. Believe it or not, in two days. Uh, the first one's pretty fast, um, but the, the, the first one, which is uh, also going to be John Rawls. Rawls' essay is about the notion of a just state or a reasonably just government. Um, but he's also got an idea, which isn't in that essay, about uh, which I'm just tossing out there to, to, as a sort of a simple, interesting way to think about it, namely the question of how somebody uh, can acquire uh, a, uh, an obligation to obey a state without you know, swearing to do so or whatever. Uh, <coughs> it's got, he thinks it's a fairly easy thing to understand some conditions where people just in fact become obligated to obey the government they're living under. But that, his way of thinking about that involves the idea 
of the government in question being reasonably just. So that brings up, brings up the big central topic, which is Rawls' theory um, about how, how to think about what a just state is. Um, and then the third thing is also Rawls, and also not in that essay, but it's Rawls' idea about how to think about civil disobedience which just for the record is, as far as I can tell, just about identical uh, with Martin Luther King Jr.'s, uh, though King never wrote about it anywhere near as systematically as Rawls did. As far as I can tell, they're on the same page, which is pretty interesting. I, they, as far as I know, they had no contact. Um, so the reason for talking about Rawls so much is not just that I think that his stuff, I find his stuff plausible, but there's no question that Rawls is the most influential political philosopher of the last 50 years, at least, uh, <coughs> maybe of the last century. And it's just sort of neat stuff. However, uh, I'm going to start by mutilating uh, <laughs> Henry David Thoreau's essay, uh, now called Civil Disobedience. Um, and and I mutilate it in the sense that I'm just going to read you a few passages out of it. I don't have time to read you the whole thing, and not all of it's directly relevant. But um, part of the reason for doing this is that uh, Thoreau lived at a pretty interesting time in American history. He thought that the government he lived under in the, in the 1840s uh, was absolutely unacceptable. Nobody had any obligation to obey this state. It practiced slavery. It was waging war on Mexico. It was ripping up every Indian treaty it ever signed. Uh, I mean, it just had no use for it. But he's talking about here about what kind of state would deserve someone's uh, allegiance. <coughs> and then built into it, and why it's called civil dis disobedience, in a kind of, not in an isolated way, but sort of threaded through the essay is a question about uh, the right to civil disobedience. Um, Lastly, the last reason for picking Thoreau to, to just sort of uh, the, the first person to think about is that Thoreau has this, he doesn't put it in quite these words, but this is in, in effect what he's, how he's thinking. Uh, he's thinking look, when, my, when I emerged from my mother's body, uh, she was in Concord, Massachusetts. And as a result of that, uh, there are some people in Concord who think they get to tell me what to do about certain things. They want some of my own. Right? <laughs> and then there's another group over in Boston, uh, and they think they get to tell me what to do about some things. They want some taxes, too. And then there's a third group down there in Washington, and they think they get to tell me, all because I was, my mother was in Concord, Massachusetts when I was born. How the hell did this happen? I mean, what, <laughs> right now, come, what's going on here? Which is a neat way, I think, to raise really fundamental questions about the relationship between individual human beings and governments. Right? Uh, how does it happen? Uh, so anyway, um, science which, you know, it's just well-written stuff. Uh, and if you haven't ever read any Thoreau, put it on your list. Uh, don't let your life go by without reading any David Thoreau. Um, Sometime when you're uh, in when you're in the mood to just kill some time, quote uh, Thoreau has a great motto: "As though you can kill time without damaging eternity." <laughs> but don't think about killing time. Okay, so if you know the transitions aren't going to be smooth here, I'm just going to read you some passages where uh, interesting stuff comes up. Um, <coughs> Uh, the, speaking now of democracies, the practical reason why, when the power is once in the hands of the people, a majority are permitted and for a long period continue to rule, is not because they are most likely to be in the right, nor because this seems fairest to, to the minority, but because they are physically the strongest. But a government in which the majority rule in all cases cannot be based on justice, even as far as men understand it. Can there not be a government in which majorities do not virtually decide right and wrong, but conscience? In which majorities decide only those questions to which the rule of expediency is applicable? The rule of expediency is just how do we get from point A to point B, right? What, what's going to get the job done? <coughs> uh, 
Um, must the citizen ever for a moment, or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislator? Why has every man a conscience then? I think, this is all sexist language, I hope you just have to put up with that, I hope you can. I think that we should be men first and subjects afterward. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think right. It is truly enough said that a corporation has no conscience, but a corporation of conscientious men is a corporation with a conscience. Law never made, made men a whit more just, and by means of their respect for the law, even the well-disposed are daily made the agents of injustice. A common and natural result of an undue respect for law is that you may see a file of soldiers, colonel, captain, corporal, privates, and all marching in admirable order over hill and dale to the wars against their wills, a against their common sense and consciences, which makes it very steep marching indeed and produces a palpitation of the heart. They have no doubt that it is a damnable business in which they are concerned. They are all peaceably inclined. Now, what are they? Men at all or small movable forts at the service of some unscrupulous man in power? The mass of men serve the state not as men mainly, but as machines with their bodies. Uh, <laughs> and I'll go, he's, he's going on about the point he's just been making here. Uh, uh, so here we go. How does it become a man to behave toward this American government today? I answer that he cannot without disgrace be associated with it. I cannot for an instant recognize that political organization as my government, which is also the slave's government. All men recognize the right of revolution, that is, the right to refuse allegiance to and to resist the government when its tyranny or its inefficiency are great and unendurable. But almost all say that such is not the case now. Such was the case, they think, in the revolution of 75. If one were to tell me that this was a bad government because it taxed certain foreign commodities brought to its ports, it is most probable that I should not make a fuss about it, for I can do without the commodities. All machines have their friction, and possibly this one does enough good to counterbalance the evil. At any rate, it is a great evil to make a stir about it. But when the friction has the machine, and oppression and robbery are organized, I say let us not have such a machine any longer. In other words, when one-sixth of the population of a nation which is undertaken to be the refuge of liberty are slaves, and a whole country is unjustly and overrun and conquered by its army, I think that it is not too soon for honest men to rebel and revolutionize. <clears throat> if I have unjustly wrested a plank from a drowning man, I must restore it to him, though I drown myself. Uh, this people must cease to hold slaves and to make war on Mexico, even though it cost them their existence as a people. Does anyone think that Massachusetts does exactly what is right at the present crisis? Practically speaking, the opponents to a reform in Massachusetts are not 100,000, he's now talking about the slavery issue, right? Um, and the, uh, the, 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 national, the national issue. Uh, practically speaking, the opponents to a reform in Massachusetts are not 100,000 politicians in the South, but 100,000 merchants and farmers here who are more interested in commerce and agriculture than they are in humanity, and are not prepared to do justice to the slave and to Mexico, cost what it may. I quarrel not with far off foes, but with those who, near at home, cooperate with and do the bidding of those far away, and without whom the latter would be harmless. It is not a man's duty, uh, as a matter of course, to devote himself to the eradication of any, even the most enormous, wrong. He may still properly have other concerns to engage in, but it is his duty, at least, to wash his hands of it, and if he gives it no thought longer, not to give it practically his support. If I devote myself to other pursuits and contemplations, I must, fir see, I must first see, at least, that I do not pursue them sitting upon another man's shoulders. I must get off him first, that he may pursue his contemplations, too. Um, unjust laws exist, 
Shall we be content to obey them, or shall we endeavor to amend them, and obey them, and obey them until we have succeeded, or shall we transgress them at once? Men generally, under such a government as this, think that they ought to wait until they have persuaded the majority to alter them. They think that if they should resist, the remedy would be worse than the evil. But it is the fault of the government itself that the remedy is worse than the evil. It makes it worse. Why, why is the government not more apt to anticipate and provide, provide for reform? Why does it not cherish its wise minority? Why does it cry and resist before it is hurt? Why does it not encourage its citizens to be on the alert to point out its faults? Why does it always crucify Christ and excommunicate Copernicus and Luther and pronounce Washington and Franklin rebels? As for adopting the ways which the state has provided for remedying the evil, go to court, get yourself elected to the legislature, do, follow the rules. As for following the, adopting the ways the state has provided for remedying the evil, I know not of such ways. They take too much time, and a man's life will be gone. I have other affairs to attend to. I came into this world not chiefly to make this a good place to live in, but to live in it, be it good or bad. A man has not everything to do, but something. And because he cannot do everything, it is not necessary that he should do something wrong. It is not my business to be petitioning the governor or the legislature any more than it is their business to petition me. And if they should not hear my petition, what should I do then? But in this case, the state has provided no way. Its very constitution is the evil. Again, talking about, <coughs> about among other things, slavery. This may seem to be harsh and stubborn and unconciliatory, but it is to treat with the utmost kindness and consideration the only spirit that can appreciate or deserves it. So is all change for the better, like birth and death which convulse the body. <laughs> um, yeah, this is just, just this, a piece of prose. I, I just have to read this. Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also a prison. The proper place today, the only place which Massachusetts has provided for her freer and less desponding spirits, is in her prisons, to be put out and locked out of the state by her own act, as they have already put themselves out by their principles. It is there that the fugitive slave and the Mexican prisoner on parole and the Indian come to plead the wrongs of his race should find them on that separate but more free and honorable ground where the state places those who are not with her but against her, the only house in a slave state in which a man, a free man, can abide with honor. <coughs> One bit of humor in this essay, so let me include that too. Some years ago, the state met me on behalf of the church and commanded me to pay a certain sum toward the support of a clergyman whose preaching my father attended, but never I myself. Okay, so they had some church that was entitled to have the city go around and, and <laughs> get support for it, which uh, his father attended, but he never did. Pay, it said, or be locked up in the jail. I declined to pay, but unfortunately, another man saw fit to, to pay it. In just in case anybody, any of you know about this period, the other person was Ralph Waldo Emerson, who paid, uh, <laughs> paid Thoreau's uh, what they, whatever they wanted. I did not see why the schoolmaster should be taxed to support the priest, and not the priest, the schoolmaster. For I was not the state schoolmaster, but I supported myself by voluntary subscription. So, he's a private teacher. The town's not out there dredging up money for him, and they've got a private preacher over there, they're, they're out dredging up money for him, how come? <laughs> I, I, I teachers just as good as preachers. Uh, <clears throat> I did not see why the school should not present its tax bill and have the state to back its demand, as well as the church. However, at the request of the select men, this is the, the local form of government up there, I condescended to make some such statement as this in writing, quote, Know all men by these presents that I, Henry Thoreau, do not wish to be regarded as a member of any incorporated society which I have not joined, unquote. 
This I gave to the town clerk, and he has it. The state, having thus learned that I did not wish to be regarded as a member of that church, has never made a similar demand on me since. If I had known how to name them, I should then have signed off in detail from all the societies I never signed on to, but I didn't know where to find a complete list. <laughs> uh, Thoreau having a little bit of fun. There you have it, all the, <laughs> all the, the uh, central passages about his relationship to the government and the reasons for them. Um, in passing, there's something, there's another reason that I uh, like reading this, um, has to do with uh, the difference between Thoreau and Peter Singer, as uh, found in that uh, essay we talked about last time. Uh, I think it's a really interesting contrast. If I ever taught an ethics class, I might start out with these two things. I mean, here's Peter Singer's simple argument, right? That suffering from, uh, as a result of uh, illness, lack of food and shelter, bad things. If you can prevent something bad, basically at no cost yourself, then you're morally obligated to do it, period. Right? Uh, so it turns out, in Singer's view, that uh, we have a lot of moral obligations, those of us who have got some disposable income. The world is full of situations that we can, uh, we can take minor steps toward remedying where we can make a difference, uh, and we've got a moral obligation to do it. Thoreau, in a short passage, which uh, I just it's included among those I just read, is the one where he says, you know, I, I didn't come into this world to make it a better place. I came into it just to live in it. Uh, and he thinks that he's okay if he does that. He, it's just okay for him to just live on his own and uh, not worry about what he might be able to do to help other people in desperate situations or whatever, with one proviso, which is an important proviso. You can't be sitting on somebody else's shoulders when you're doing that, right? Now, clearly, what he's got in mind is, at least in part, uh, the slave uh, culture that we had at the time, with, uh, as he points out, the whole, the whole country. Lots of people all over the country, not just in the South, were benefiting uh, from the existence of that economy. Uh, <coughs> uh, and uh, also, as a matter of fact, by evacuating Indians from their, uh, their native lands and taking them over for the purposes of our economy, so uh, Thoreau's idea is he's got to be sure he's not having a good time in his life pursuing his own interest at the expense of people who's, uh, without whom he couldn't be doing it. So right, he's, got, he's got to get off their shoulders. Uh, and that's also you know, a fairly appealing view, it seems to me. I mean, he's right. Nobody comes into this world to make it a better place. Uh, and. There's some appeal, at least. <laughs> Depends on how recently you've been thinking about singing. Some appeal to the idea, look, as long as I'm doing it on my own, sitting on my own bottom, I'm just taking care of myself, uh, not harming anybody else, um, then uh, it's OK for me just to be, sort of, so to speak, self-centered. Uh, I can go off and, and do my own thing. The question is what, sort of what's wrong with that. Of course, singing wants to say there's something wrong with it. Uh, but it seems to me that you know you get, you get pulled in both directions on that, and those are those are two sort of ground level, common sense kind of ways of thinking about about how it's okay for human beings to behave uh, that have both got some appeal, and they, they can't both be right. Um, the one other comment about about Thoreau is that, um, and I probably didn't read enough of the essay, so you could pick this up very well, but. Uh, Thoreau is, and he's got several things going, and one of which is, obviously, that this one is clear, that uh, you, you, know, you can't, a, a, a decent human being can't be associated with the American government of the 1840s, and he just can't. It's a slave country, uh, and it's a treaty-breaking country with all the tribes, uh, plus, in Thoreau's judgment, it's waging an aggressive war on Mexico. 
uh, who the hell can uh, be associated with a government like that uh, and pledge it its allegiance um, or his or her allegiance? Um, but the question, the conditions under which he would think that it was okay uh, to um, to pledge your allegiance to and to support a government with your taxes or whatever, um, and maybe even uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Conditions under which it would be okay uh, are, are, you can sort of pick up going through uh, the essay. He occasionally addresses it directly, but he never really sort of drills to the bottom of this and sort of comes up with an idea about a clear set of conditions. If these things were true, then it would be okay for somebody, uh, morally acceptable for somebody to pledge allegiance to the country, agree to obey uh, its government insofar as it stayed within its own laws. <clears throat> well, one of the things that, um, so you, you, you're kind of left with a puzzle, because uh, Thoreau uh, likes the idea of cooperative endeavors. I skipped a little passage where he talks about never, minding, uh, <coughs> never having minded paying the highway tax. Because uh, it builds roads and everybody gets to use them, right? So he's, it's not as though he's opposed to government. What he's opposed to is immoral government. But so what? What sort of government would really command his allegiance? Uh, sort of make it irresistible for him to um, to agree to it um, is pretty unclear. Which is okay. I mean, as I say, he's not writing a philosophical essay. He's reflecting on a lot of different things in this essay. Um, but, and he does get the question raised, right? Where, how does it happen that a government, some of these, these, uh, these three different governments, the town, the, the state capital, and, and Washington, all of whom seem to think they have some rights uh, about uh, how, they, how I'm to be treated and what, what, how, what I have to do. Um, well, um, so, switch to this first simple, uh, relatively simple, uh, proposal of uh, Rawls's about conditions under wh which, if these conditions obtain, right, uh, if they hold, then a person does, in fact, in his view, have an obligation to obey the government. Rawls thinks of th that it's possible for this kind of thing to happen, for, for human beings to uh, acquire an obligation to obey a government without ever, uh, 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 clearly, without ever uh, sort of swearing an oath of allegiance. Right? He thinks, but he thinks that there is such a thing as natural obligations. Obligations sometimes arise out of the facts on the ground. Right? And the most obvious kind of case that I can think of where he would think people could acquire an obligation without ever having said to a word a word to each other. I mean, not that that's terribly important. But just <laughs> what I'm thinking of uh, is the process of producing a child. You know, w without what I'm imagining is that there's some sort of science fiction world in which a couple uh, they, they could uh, <coughs> be. Um, have perfect, perfect happiness and agreement about having a sexual relationship without ever having said a word to each other. Not important. The point is that they never need to have uh, talked about having children. Uh, they just made love on some occasion and she got pregnant. Nine months later, a child emerges into the world. Uh, I'm sure Valls thinks, although I don't think he ever talks about this case anywhere, there's a perfectly good example of what he would think of as an obligation that arises out of a set of natural facts. Two people have sex, a third person emerges into the world nine months later. Those two people have a responsibility to take care of that child, okay? period. Right? It's just a fact about them and the child that they have the responsibility uh, to take care of the child. They ought to take care of the child. They're obligated to take care of the child. So uh, that's his, that way of thinking about how you can become obligated to obey a country is like that. I mean, it's a very different set of facts, obviously. Uh, but 
<coughs> by virtue of certain facts, um, a, a person can become obligated to obey God. The first one is, and this is the one that leads on to the, the big topic, right, uh, of justice. The first condition is, uh, I'm going to talk about the state just because it's his terminology and it's shorter than the word government. The first condition is that the state of the government is reasonably just. S is obligated to obey the state under which she lives if these things are true. So right, we're talking about a government that's reasonably just. Uh, the reason for that requirement is that uh, I mean, what you're excluding here is worrying about whether you could be obligated to obey the government in a military dictatorship, uh, say, right? Uh, or obey the government in your own country uh, if it was reasonably just before but a revolution happened, it got over, it got thrown over, and a military junta is now running it, or whatever. Yes? Can you re read that? Can I read this? Sure. S is obligated to obey the state under which she lives if the state is reasonably just. The first condition. Uh, <clears throat> so there can be you know, lots of different kinds of governments. So, and, and what, what Rawls is saying, right, that's the reason for this, if. If, if all these things I'm going to put up here, the four of them, right? If they're all true, then that's enough. It's sufficient for uh, us to be obligated to obey the state. Okay? Uh, they might be able. They might be obligated to obey it under on, all kinds of other conditions as well. But he, it's just the idea is: look, it's not hard to understand how somebody can become obligated to obey a state if these conditions are met, which isn't which is no, uh, not, not the rarest thing in the world, uh, then they're obligated. So the second condition is that S benefits from the existence of the state. So the state builds highways, it provides uh, <coughs> police and fire protection services, it provides national defense, it does, it, it does all kinds of things, right? Uh, and the person benefits from the existence uh, of this state. Third, uh, you get two psychological facts about us, okay? Um, sorry, I'm going to put them in the right order here, right? Uh, S expect to continue to benefit from the state and as expects others to do their part uh, to maintain the state in existence, to keep it going, pay their, pay their taxes or whatever, uh, so to maintain the existence of the state. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read the rest of them again. S benefits from the existence of the state. S expects to continue to benefit from the state. And S expects others to do their part to keep the thing going. Uh, so the idea is if that's the, your situation, you know, you're living under a reasonably just government, uh, it's 
you're getting some benefits out of it, uh, and you plan to continue that. Uh, and you expect the rest of these <laughs> the rest of these folks around here to pay their taxes or whatever uh, to keep it going. Then you've got an obligation to pay your taxes. You have an obligation to obey the government what it's what it's requiring. Okay. Yeah. Does it mean what? Progressively more beneficial? Or just no, beneficial just, just continuity. Just just continuing to benefit, right? Um, okay, so the Rawls doesn't think this is a big mystery. I mean people if you if you people can disagree with him about this and have their own idea about how you how this can happen. Um, that you become obligated to obey a state. And it, uh, other ways of thinking might, about it might not be terribly demanding either. Um, the, the, I just bracket, it's not altogether clear to me that Thoreau thinks that there is any such set of conditions, right? Uh, that, I mean, I don't know whether he would agree with this or not. He, he Thoreau thinks a lot. It's perfectly okay. He thinks a lot about the possibility of just living independently of the state. I mean, he'd rather not have anything to do with it. I mean, you know, he, when he talks about the paying the highway tax, I mean, it's like it's sort of a local one-time agreement. Hey, we need a road from here to here. You want to pitch in, right? And uh, which means you don't actually have a tax, uh, and that means you don't have to have a tax collector, and that means you don't have to have a jail to put the people in who don't pay their taxes, right? All that kind of stuff. That, you, that happens, you know, you need a lot of stuff to have any kind of state going at all. Uh, you, you, you need a fairly elaborate thing, quite, at least pretty likely. So Thoreau is a little bit hard to pin down. But there's Rawls's suggestion, Rawls's uh, thought about uh, how somebody can become obligated to obey a state without ever taking an oath that they will obey the state. They just grow up there, right? Uh, so I fit in this category, I assume so do a bunch of you. You're born here, at least if you think this government is reasonably just, uh, the rest of it's true. Um, <coughs> you're all benefiting from the existence of the state by getting to listen to my lecture. <laughs> by coming to this university, okay? Just a little humor, folks. Um, okay, so what do we do about this thing here? What, how do you think about what a just state is. And there is a long tradition in Western philosophy um, of thinking about this under something called the social contract theory. As the idea is that what really underlies a, uh, an acceptable government, a form of government, is something that emerges out of some murky uh, so uh, transaction among various members of the European races, uh, the European ethnic groups, right? this kind of social contract, which gives rise to uh, various forms of government. Uh, it's actually a very interesting, a very interesting uh, history of, of uh, the history of is, is interesting philosophical stuff. Um, but what Rawls does is to sort of grab hold of that idea and give it a real twist um, and because he thinks there's, there's a kernel of truth in here um, that there's something about what human beings have got in common uh, how they understand each other, the, an implicit contract between them uh, that is responsible for the fact that some governments which somehow uh, recognize uh, and have the right relationship to that basic human uh, contract or human relationship, uh, non-governmental one, uh, why they're, why they're uh, acceptable governments. What he does is to uh, ask you to imagine a totally hypothetical, and I mean totally hypothetical, you'll see how hypothetical it is in, in a minute, it's, it's a radically uh, non-real situation. Um, the reasons for it being non-real. The idea is to picture a situation in which a bunch of people uh, have decided that they need to figure out some way to do some serious 
cooperate. Okay? Maybe the first thing they think of is that they need to get some defense forces organized against the neighboring tribes. Uh, maybe what they need is to do some serious organizing of the ability uh, to collect sustenance for the community, whatever it is, whether it's fishing, hunting, whatever. Uh, <coughs> who knows, right? Um, there are all kinds of ways that a community uh, can sometimes do things a lot better than individuals can. And in some situations, it's pretty important that the community get together because if each person tries to do it on its own, on their own, it's going to be a damned hard job. So uh, this, is, this is what uh, Rawls thinks about. Now, what he, what he wants you to do is to imagine that w what you've got is a bunch of rational, <laughs> free, and self-interested okay. uh, rational people, but what he means by their being rational is that they're pretty good at figuring out how to get from point A to point B. Right? They know how the world works. They, they know if you want to get this done, the, uh, it's a good idea to start here, do this, do this. Right? They have ideas. They may, not, they may not agree about the details, but they know how to uh, uh, rationally address the problem, the, the, the need to solve some problem. Right? So they're rational. Right? They're free. Each of them is totally free. They have no commitments to anybody else. So they don't have any new babies, for example, right? <laughs> they're just, they're like these atomic people. Um, they, they're, and the reason for this is that what, what, what Rawls wants is for you to think about people who, in, in the course of the deliberations, as this group tries to put together some form of cooperation, some sort of minimal government, that they can leave anytime they want to. They're completely free to leave, right? But they're also free to stay. They can make any commitments they want to because they have no commitments anywhere else. Right? So they're totally free to make or refuse to make any commitments that they decide to vote on trying to put in place. And they're self-interested. Um, that does not mean selfish. What it means is, uh, what Rawls is thinking of is e each of these people wants to try to uh, arrange things in this community so you know in a way that will maximize their personal chances of leading a pretty decent life right? managing to pursue whatever inter the interest they have they have without worrying about whether they're going to starve to death the next day right? so they want they want to come up with a scheme that's going to enable them uh, that gives them a very good chance of, uh, of being able to carry out a, a plan for how to spend their life and, and, and achieve some of the things that they want to do. Right? So they're self-interested in wanting to just have a decent life and not be ripped apart by the forces of nature before they can have a life. So these are the people, right? Um, now, they, what these folks know is two things. Um, they know cooperation is necessary. There's this famous phrase of Thomas Hobbes that everybody's heard by now, but if you haven't, oh, you can hurt to hear it again. But in the state of nature, Hobbes' idea is that human life is nasty, poor, brutish, and short. Right? It ain't the way to go. Right? <laughs> Going it on your own in, in, in the state of nature uh, is practically suicidal. And it's true you can do it, but uh, on the whole, life is nasty, poor, brutish, and short, and the chances of your having a nice life and being able to do the things you want to do are about zero. Uh, <coughs> so, in that sense, cooperation is necessary. It doesn't mean that you're going to die right away if you can't cooperate, but it does mean you're not going to be able to have anything like the kind of life that you think it's reasonable to hope to have. 
The other uh, <coughs> thing that they know, for purposes of this, remember this is a whole hypothetical. They know properties are necessary. This is a hypothetical situation. Uh, we just imagine that that's true. Uh, the second is that they know that cooperation is possible. And what and one way that people sometimes that would, would put this is that they know that they're not in what's called a life raft situation, right? So uh, if a ship goes down in the middle of the Pacific, 2,000 miles from anywhere, uh, and a lifeboat gets launched, and you got 30 people on this lifeboat, um, and it turns out that what's available in the way of resources on the life raft is one tin of crackers and one bottle of water, then cooperation is not possible. You don't want to try to call a committee of 30 people to try to decide how to drive, how to divide up the one bottle of water and the one package of crackers, uh, <laughs> given that you have at least a month to look forward to on the open seas. You're all going to die anyway. Uh, <laughs> right, so so co-op, the situation is not so desperate that cooperation is not possible in the sense that it's not rationally possible. Right? It's just it's, it's crazy to expect, even if you think you could stick with the rules, that you're in a bunch of people, all of whom are going to be able to stick by whatever rules you come up with. That's all the water crackers there are. Somebody's going to grab it and try to <laughs> preserve themselves if they possibly can. Um, OK, so they know to these two things. Right. <coughs> Actually, <coughs> I, I, I should put this this way, um, that uh, each knows that each of them, this is the third thing that they know, I shouldn't have said that when I was talking about this. Right? Not only are they irrational, free, and self interested, they know, each of them knows that they're all like this. Okay? They know what kind of people they are. They know what the kind of people they are, and they all know it. They also know that cooperation is necessary and that it's possible. Now, uh, Rawls uh, describes the situation he's talking about. Uh, or his describes it, but he labels it, is what I should say. Something he calls the original original position of equilibrium. All these things are true. I, Original position. They're all true and everybody knows that they're true. Okay? Then there's what they don't know. What they don't know, what each of them, the knowledge that each of them lacks, <laughs> is any knowledge that would distinguish them from anybody else. Remember, I said that this was seriously science fictional. I mean, this is, you know, there, can't, there can't be. Uh, obviously, uh, it couldn't actually be a situation like this. But again, Rawls is thinking of this situation in this way for a reason. Nobody knows anything that they know distinguishes them from anybody else. So you can picture these people as <coughs> in isolation booths. You know, they're communicating by computer. Uh, no pictures, please. Um, but beyond that, uh, the, 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 maybe the weirdest thing is they don't possess, they don't know which sex they are. Uh, they also, given that they don't, uh, they're, these, these are, we're not told that they're well-informed people. We're just told that they're rationally and self-interested. Self but you have to have the assumption that they had general knowledge about the human race, and so they know it's divided into ethnic groups, races, if you like. Uh, they don't know where they belong uh, in any spectrum of groups that you want to mention. 
they don't know how physically strong they are compared to anybody else. They don't know how smart they are, how much musical talent they've got. They know nothing that would allow them to place themselves in a particular category relative to other people who would not be in that category. Okay? There's nothing there to grab hold of. The reason for this cosmic ignorance right, is that you want to prevent the possibility of somebody trying to come up with some system of laws that's going to benefit their group. By whatever devious device you want to do it, you try to, try to, try to stack the deck so that your group gets a better chance at various things. Uh, well, one way to eliminate that possibility is just not let you know anything, have any idea at all about what groups you belong to uh, and that other people don't belong to. So that's what's really, right, that's how extreme right, the, the individual ignorance is here, right? Uh, you can know a lot about the world, but you can't know anything about yourself and where you stand on any of the various uh, dimensions along which people uh, can be compared. Um, and, of course, this is uh, the fourth thing that all of these people know. Everybody knows that nobody knows anything that distinguishes them from anybody else. So, we are, they all know what kind of people they are. They all know they're ignorant of anything that would mark them out from anybody else. They know they need to cooperate, and they know it's possible to cooperate. So all of that is built into Rawls's uh, picture of this so-called original position of equal liberty. Now, uh, the yeah, uh, Rawls actually argues in this. Uh, in this reading that you have. Um, and he's, uh, he's argued at uh, greater length a lot uh, elsewhere. But what Rawls claims is that this, this group, who now are going to try to come up with, each of them, a government system that they're willing to sign on to. Right? The whole idea is to get something that everybody's willing to sign uh, and that will be uh, an effective at helping each of them <coughs> kind of life that self-interested people want to lead, namely a decent life, uh, so they don't burn up their lives just trying to stay alive. And what Rawls claims is that the, these people would, the first thing they would do is adopt, and this is actual, an actual claim, I mean, it's just a, a little bit, it's obviously a pretty risky claim, but I mean, it's a, it's a sort of a psychological claim about human beings, which is a bit weird because you have to picture actual human beings in this impossible situation where they don't know anything about themselves. Right? But still, he tries to make this argument that the first thing they would do is adopt two principles of justice. Um, and you know, it's, it's a substantial, substantive argument. The, express the first one very simply, uh, or the rationale for it, like this. The, the, the idea is that the, the, the principles of justice that they adopt put restrictions on everything they do later on. Okay? The idea is that the government, whatever kind of government they come up with, it's going to have to fit uh, to be consistent with these principles. Right? And the first one, Rawls thinks that they would come up with, and this has a lot to do with the fact that at the moment, they are absolutely and unconditionally free. They owe nothing to anybody. Right? Uh, the idea is that they're going to give up as little of that freedom as they possibly can. So the, the principle of justice is going to be that everybody has the greatest amount of liberty possible that's consistent uh, with the, <laughs> I should actually put this in the official way. Uh, everybody's to have the maximum degree of liberty. Each person has the maximum degree of liberty that's consistent with everybody's having that degree of liberty, meaning that they're not going to wind up trampling on each other's feet by exercising their own liberty. Okay? So uh, Rawls has got this, you know, of course, stated elegantly. Um, let me just dig it out for you. And 
read it. But the picture, uh, I hope, is, is simple enough, right? Each of us is going to give up enough liberty. Right? We're just going to reduce it the minimum amount so that when we, what, if, if we each exercise our full liberty under the, uh, whatever the limits imposed are, we are not going to wind up colliding with each other. Right? We're not going to be violating each other's rights. Uh, <coughs> so, you know, I don't, I don't have the right uh, to just take uh, anything I want to capture other people, uh, <laughs> various things, right? There's a lot that I don't have, a, uh, I won't have the right to do under a system like this, because uh, if I had it, so would everybody else, and we'd be trying to capture each other, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, uh, right, yeah, obviously this is a very abstract characterization, but I hope you get the picture that um, right, we each give up enough liberty so that each person exercising all the liberty they've got is not going to make us run into each other right, and violating uh, each other's uh, liberty, depriving us of it or interfering with it in any way. Uh, so here is Rawls's uh, elegant formulation. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberty compatible with a similar, li with a similar liberty for others. Right? Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive liberty uh, compatible with everybody's having that amount of liberty. So, uh, you've got the picture of we have as much liberty as uh, <coughs> as we can allow ourselves to have without running uh, into collisions with each other. But what Rawls will always stress, right, is that everybody, each person in the society has this amount of liberty. There's no differentiation. Um, <coughs> now, the second uh, principle uh, is a very different kind of thing. The, if you create an institution like this, uh, any, any kind of a government at all, you're going to be creating social and political inequalities. You're going to have to pay somebody to do the job. If maybe you're going to have a, a, a tripartite government, you're going to have a, a legislature, you're going to have a judiciary, you're going to have an executive branch, whatever. Whatever kind of government you have, uh, it's going to have jobs that have to be done. People are going to have to do those. Everybody's going to have to pay people to do those jobs. Those people are going to have prestige, uh, and they're going to have income uh, <coughs> as a result. And so what this principle really talks about is when, the, when the Rawls talks about social and economic inequalities are going to be arranged a certain way. What he means is the ones that are required by whatever government we come up with. He doesn't mean the, you know, the, the, the society whole society is going to be ordered by some bunch of people in this original position and tells everybody where, to, where they fall in the social order. He's talking about the actual jobs that they are creating and the inequalities that they're creating by creating those positions. What's required is that <coughs> uh, any inequalities that are, are created are to be arranged so that two conditions are met. They are reasonably expected to be to everybody's advantage. And you don't create any position in this government except positions that, as far as you can tell, it looks will, it, like it will be to everybody's advantage to have. Right? So maybe you want whatever, let's say a chief of police, right? Uh, you don't have a chief of police unless uh, it's reasonable to think that having a chief of police is, is, it makes everybody better off. Everybody's better off if we have them than if we don't. And Rawls takes this very seriously when he says everybody's better off. When he gets into the details of his theory, um, the idea is that <coughs> the ideal principle on which you uh, determine economic policy uh, in a government is that any policy you, you adopt has to be in the interest of the worst off person in the society. It 
it's got to get to the bottom. It, it has to be in that person's interest. It doesn't mean it takes the person who's at the bottom and puts them at the top. It just means you don't spend government money creating positions or institutions or agencies or whatever <laughs> unless it's pretty reasonable to think that the existence of those things is in the interests of the worst off people in society, in which case it will also be in the interests of everybody else. Uh, but that's how he thinks about it, um, <coughs> is the effect on it. Okay, so any inequalities you create have to meet that test. They have to be to everybody's advantage. And the second equally important requirement is that they have to be, as he puts it, attached to positions and offices that are open to everybody. So you create various agencies, various, various branches of the government. The positions that are defined as having various, power, uh, various, powers, various powers in that government, they all have to be open to everybody. Uh, that one's sort of a no-brainer, uh, but it's important, obviously. And, uh, this is uh, universal um, uh, <coughs> access on the part of all adults or whatever, right? I mean, you have arbitrary categories of uh, cutoffs of that. So um, that's, what, that's what Rawls thinks would be the first business of this group of people uh, is to adopt these two principles. Because now, having adopted those, well, what they're thinking about is they're going to eventually write a constitution. Uh, and Rawls' idea is they're going to adopt these principles because whatever they come up with in the way of a constitution, which could be a pretty complicated document, it's got to be consistent with those principles. These principles cannot be violated. So yeah, at the bottom of Rawls' idea of uh, a just society is that it's one whose government is consistent with these two principles of justice. Because what Rawls, the way Rawls thinks you should think about whether a government is just or not is, is in terms of this bunch of machinery up here. Right? His idea is that a government is at least reasonably just if it could have been arrived at by a bunch of rational, free, and self-interested people beginning in a position, in the original position of equal liberty. If those people that we've described, starting in that situation where they know they need to cooperate, they know it's possible to cooperate, <coughs> they know that nobody knows anything about themselves that makes them different from anybody else. Given all that, I mean, if those people who would in fact adopt these two principles of justice, if they could arrive at the government <coughs> you're living under, right, starting from that position, then you're living under a reasonably just government. Uh, whether you're fully persuaded of that or not, uh, uh, sort of beside the point, but it seems to me to be, is, it's no surprise that Rawls uh, was as important a figure as, as he was and still is. Uh, it's, a, it's a really creative way to think about how to get at, how to get at the, the, the basic notion of fairness, which is why, why his essay is called Justice is Fairness. Um, he wrote that essay, I mean, an essay of that type, of that title before he wrote his magnum opus. Uh, but that was what, always what was driving his thinking, that somehow to put some meat on the bones of the idea that justice is fairness. Right? And so in thinking about what a just state is, he <laughs> comes up uh, with all this stuff. The fairness part is built in basically with the amount of ignorance that these people have got about themselves. Right? Uh, what's going to come out of this group is going to be fair in some fairly clear sense uh, just because there's no way for anybody or any group uh, to try to slant the deck or stack the deck uh, in their favor. Uh, so you know, it's, I, I think it's just uh, a deeply ingenious way of, of trying to think about sort of the intuitions we all have about what constitutes uh, justice, at least in the form of uh, institutional justice. Um, and there it is. So 
the idea is that right, they start there, they come, they get to the principles, and then they write a constitution. Now, the, the idea is that the constitution, that they don't screw up at this point, right? They have to write a constitution that's consistent with the principles they just adopted, right? The, the, the constitution cannot violate these two principles of the, the, most, the greatest, most extensive liberty compatible with everybody having it and no inequalities that aren't to everybody's advantage, right? So you have to write your constitution so it meets that condition. <coughs> Which, of course, it's worth noticing, the American Constitution didn't meet. Uh, the, uh, there were lots and lots and lots of folks in this country uh, who were under the authority of that government, uh, but were not, uh, did not have, to say the least, uh, the same liberty that many others did, including the liberty to vote. But in any case, um, and so the, the, the requirement, the ultimate requirement is that the Constitution that you adopt has to itself be consistent with the, the two principles that you adopted earlier. If so, then you've got a reasonably just government. Now, <coughs> um, Thursday, come back and we're gonna talk about this phenomenon. Suppose you've got a government that's reasonably just on paper. You have a, uh, a constitution that's consistent with the two principles of justice. Um, governments uh, can look pretty good on paper and be pretty bad in the flesh, right? I mean, a government is not just the document. Uh, one of the questions about any government you're actually living under is what its constitution is. The other is what it's actually doing. Uh, and as we all know, one of the things that happens with great regularity uh, in this particular democracy is that the Supreme Court decides that laws that have been passed by the legislative branch violate the Constitution. There's the Constitution that says you can't do certain things. Right? According to the courts, the legislature does them all the time. So you get these questions about sort of how you relate to the actual government as opposed to just the document. Uh, and that takes us to civil disobedience. So, next time. And I'll be in touch as soon as I know anything about your papers, folks.